thee tonight for the glorious message of the gospel. We bless thee that it's old, but it's ever new. We thank thee that it takes away the old, and it puts new things in our heart, and it puts a new heart within our souls. Oh God, we rejoice and bless your name for the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless thee that this blood has lost none of its ancient power, and that the gospel is just as powerful today as it was in the first century of the Christian church. Oh God, we pray that you would help us as we preach the word of God tonight. Give us great liberty in the preaching of this book. Lord, we thank thee that the entrance of thy word give us light. May there be light tonight, dispelling the darkness of sin and the darkness of ignorance as thy word is proclaimed. We thank thee for that great service that we have this morning. Bless thy servant as he ministers the word of God in the hurry tonight. May the fullness of the blessing be upon him. And Lord, we thank thee for the great meeting we had this afternoon in Tenrigi. We thank thee for the crowds that gathered and for that dear man who stepped out boldly for Jesus Christ and said, I will trust the Lord today. Lord, we bless thee that this is a saving gospel that we preach. Oh God, give us great liberty in this service this evening. Apply the word to the hearts of man. Grant that thy word may have free course, that it may run and be glorified in this service. We thank thee for all who have gathered to hear thy word. And we pray that tonight, that as they listen, they will be blessed indeed in their hearts. Oh God, send revival to this city of ours, to this land of ours, to this nation of ours. Oh God, in wrath, remember mercy and visit us as thou didst visit us of old. Thou art the God of the patriarchs. Thou art the God of the prophets. Thou art the God of the apostles. Thou art the God of the reformers. Thou art the God of Whitfield and Wesley, of Spurgeon, of Calvin and of Knox. Thou art our Father's God. Thou art our God. Thou art the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, visit us tonight. Bless us tonight. Rend the heavens and come down. Let the mountains flow with thy presence. Send us a tide of blessing upon the service. And do us good this night for Jesus' sake. And the people of God said, Amen. 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 My soul in sad exile was out on life's sea, so burdened with sin and distress, till I heard a sweet voice saying, make me your choice, and I entered the
and faith taking hold of the word, my fetters fell off, and I anchored my soul, the haven of rest is my Lord, I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest, I sail the white seas no more, the tempest may sweep all the wild stormy deep, in Jesus I'm If you have your Bible, I want you to open it at this 17th chapter of the first book of Samuel. I want this evening to bring to you a message founded upon this great historical narrative concerning David's victory over Goliath. Of Gath. The title of my message is Slaying the Ecumenical Monster. This chapter opens with the record of an invasion that took place. The armies of the Philistines, the uncircumcised Philistines, the enemies of the covenant people of Israel had invaded the territory of Israel and had gathered together their armies on the soil of Israel. If you look at verse 1, you will find that they occupied the territory that belonged to the tribe of Judah. They were invaders and usurpers of the Lord's heritage. The tribe of Judah is, of course, the royal tribe. Jesus Christ was, of course, to come of Judah's tribe. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Not very difficult, is it, to draw the parallel? Today, the territory of the Lord has been invaded. Today, usurpers are in possession of the dominion and the heritage that rightly belongs to Christ. You have usurpers in the pulpits of this very city. You have usurpers in the churches 
of this very city. They have invaded the territory of the Lord and they have occupied positions that rightly and legally belong to the people of God. And of course, when this invasion took place, Saul and his men gathered to stand up to the invader and to resist the increasing aggression of the Philistines. If you look with me at verse 3, you will discover that there is a great division between the armies of Israel and the armies of the enemy. There was a valley between them. And my friend, if we're going to fight the Lord's battles, there must be the mark and there must be the clear cut line of demarcation dividing the armies of the Lord's enemies from the armies of the Lord's servants. We live in a day when men want to blur this line. We live in a day when men want to have fellowship across the boundary line. The armies of Israel didn't cross the boundary to fellowship. They crossed the boundary to fight. My friend, when I go down to meet the apostates, I don't go down to shake hands with them. I don't go down to a coffee party or a cheese breakfast either. I go down to do battle with the enemies of the gospel of Christ. We have people in this city and they want to be all things to all men. And if they're with the evangelicals, they will run with the evangelicals. If they're with the modernists, they will run with the modernists. If they're with the papists, they'll run with the papists. My friend, this is not the mark of the man who's in the Lord's army. The man who's in the Lord's army, he stands divided and separated from the enemies of the gospel. But I want you to notice that out of the army of the Lord's enemies, there came a great champion, a great monster, Goliath of Gath. And we have a description of this monster, this giant, this monstrosity coming out of the armies of the enemies of the gospel. Here he is, Goliath of Gath. Have a look at him. He is six cubits and a span in height. Note the number six. That's very important. Then he had six pieces of armor. That's very important too. He had a helmet of brass. He was armed with a coat of mail. He had greaves of brass. He had a target of brass. He had a spear and he had a shield. Six pieces of armor. Then have a look with me at verse 7 and you will discover that his spear's head was 600 shekels of iron. So stamped upon this monster is the number six. And six in Scripture is the number of man. He was built made on the sixth day. He never attained to the perfection of seven. And three sixes is the number of the Antichrist. Turn to Revelation chapter 13 and the last verse of Revelation 13. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six, 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 six. So stepped upon Goliath is the number of the Antichrist. Of course, Goliath of Gath is a type of the great ecumenical monstrosity that has come out of the armies of the Lord's enemies to attack those that stand 
for God and for truth. I want you to notice that this giant of a man, he wasn't prepared to take on half a dozen of the Israelites. That would have been a fair fight. But he just wanted one little Israelite. He was such a craven coward. He was such a bully that he wasn't prepared to take on as much. No, he wanted just to take on one Israelite. And then having dealt with one, he wanted the whole camp of Israel to capitulate. And this great ecumenical monster, this ecclesiastical monstrosity, the World Council of Churches would like to take on just one little fundamentalist. And having strangled the life out of one fundamentalist, they would expect everybody else to join with them. Let me say tonight that the bully of ecumenism, let me say tonight that no fundamentalist could ever bow before this great ecumenical monstrosity. There can be no worshiping at the ecumenical shrine. There can be no alliance between God's people and the uncircumcised. Truth and error cannot be mixed. There must be separation. And you will notice that the voice of this Philistine was heard. We hear the voice of the ecumenical movement. We hear it on the radio. We hear it in the press. We hear it from the platforms. We hear it even in the parliamentary debates. The voice of the great ecumenical movement. And they tell us the opposition is only a few bigots and extremists. There's nothing to worry about the opposition. And this great ecclesiastical monstrosity, it goes through the land defying the God of heaven. Now what happened? Well, you'll find out what happens here in verse 11. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed. It's just like the evangelicals of our day, they're dismayed. And they're sore, greatly afraid. Isn't this just like the fundamentalists today? Great fear has entered into their heart. And they say, no, we can't battle. Oh, that is a law. Let's have our little gospel services. Let's have our little conventions. Let's all keep happy. Let's bury our head in the sand. Don't let's hear that fellow Paisley in the Ulster Hall. He's only a disturber. He's only calling our attention to something we don't want to think about. Oh, let us sing our hymns and clap our hands. And let's have a wonderful time. But we have no stomach for the fight. We're afraid of the battle. We can't stand against this ecumenical movement. Isn't this what's happening today? Greatly afraid. Well, of course, immediately you read that. It says, now David. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Now David. Who was he? He was just a boy. But you know who he was? He was an eighth son. It's a very interesting thing. The numbers in Scripture are very important. The number eight is the number of resurrection. The start of a new series. There are only seven notes in music. I can't sing any one of them, but I know that there are seven notes. And then when you come to the eighth, you start a new series, don't you? The octave. And my friend, let me tell you tonight... That the eighth day is the first day, the day of resurrection. Who was David? He was an eighth son. He was a type of a man that had died and was risen again. That's the only person that can fight the Lord's battles. Some people haven't died to their denominational status. No, sir. They're more fond of the party than the person of Jesus Christ. Some people haven't died to what the world thinks about them. Some people haven't died to their own selfish motives and selfish interests. 
And the man that's going to fight God's battles has got to be absolutely dead to this world. He doesn't care what man say about him. Doesn't care what party leaders think about him. He doesn't care what the press says about him. He cares for no man. He cares only for the smile of heaven. My, if you have the smile of heaven, you needn't worry about the scorns and the frowns and the sneers of man. Young David, what was he doing? He was doing the father's business. He was minding the flock. And he was minding it well. And the father called to him. And he was responsive to the father's call. And the father sent him into the army to take the health of his brethren, to carry to them sustenance for the toil and the heat of the day. And when he arrived in the battle, he heard Goliath of Gath. He heard the defiant champion coming out and defying the armies of Israel. You know what David said? Look at verse 29. David said, Is there not a cause? That's a tremendous verse. That was the text C.H. Spurgeon took when he started his battle with apostasy in the Baptist Union of Great Britain and Ireland. That was his great text. Is there not a cause? And praise God, there is a cause today. It's not the cause of the Free Presbyterian Church. It's not the cause of any denomination. It's not the cause of any particular theological group. The thinkers are philosophers. It's the cause of God against the devil. It's the cause of heaven against hell. It's the cause of truth against the lie. It's the cause of Jesus Christ against the Antichrist. That's the cause that we're in. Is there not a cause? Yes, sir, there is a cause. There's a cause for all this battle. Just a few weeks ago, the battle lines were drawn in South India. South India has been a place of great victories for the cause of Jesus Christ. A few years ago, the St. Thomas Evangelical Church separated itself from the Mar Thomas Church. And 20,000 people left the World Council in South India. That was a great victory. Then a few years ago, the Church of England Missionary Diocese, with 70,000 people under Bishop Stevens, they pulled out of the World Council of Churches. That was a great victory. But in the last five weeks, there has been even a greater victory. The whole missionary organization of one of the big Baptist denominations in the United States of America that had churches and mission stations, almost 500 churches and mission stations, with 179,000 people, all left the World Council of Churches. is that a wonderful thing? That's one of the greatest victories that we have had in this day. And they have joined the International Council of Christian Churches. We heal them as fellow soldiers and fellow brethren in this great fight. And let me tell you something else. Ten days ago, approximately, the General Assembly of the whole Presbyterian Church in Pakistan, by over two-thirds majority, left the World Council of Churches. This is the largest Presbyterian body ever to do so. Called right on and have swung their leadership behind the banner of the International Council of Christian Churches. That's something to praise God for, isn't it? Is there not a cause? Praise God, there is a cause. And men across the world are rallying to the great cause the great battle that's being fought. But you know, when David took up this challenge, his elder brother looked down his nose at him. Look at Eliab in verse 28. And he said, David, 
What are you doing here? Get you away home to your sheep. I know the naughtiness of your heart. You're only a spectator. You came to see the battle. What was Eliab talking about? He was a spectator. He was worse than a spectator. He ran away. He ran, ran the wrong road when the battle was. But he's looking down his nose at his brother. And I want to tell you, friend, you'll get opposition not only from the world, the flesh, and the devil, but you'll get it from your own Christian brethren when you take a stand for God. Mr. Nicholson used to say, the worst opponents of God's work are those old bald-headed rascals in the pew that have backslid for 40 years. He says, watch that. Well, some of them are not bald-headed. They have a good crop of hair yet, but they're still backslidden nevertheless. Let me tell you something, my friend. You get up and stand for God and you'll be in trouble. Let a man... Stand for God, and he'll be in trouble. I heard that Pastor Orr speaking at the induction or reception to the new minister of Great Victoria Street Baptist Church said this. He said, I've always been a rebel. Yes, always been a rebel. Thank God for men that are rebels for the cause of Christ. You're not going to be knocked into shape are not going to be hammered into the grove by an ecclesiastical hierarchy. Thank God for men who are free men in the Lord. He'll take over the traces. I'm glad I'm the son of such a man. I'm glad tonight my father refused to be tied. He refused to compromise. One of the churches he pastored, there was a man in office, a deacon, and he had a large portion of ground. And on the ground there was a public house. And he drew the money from the pub that was on the ground. And when my father slew the liquor traffic, my, that old deacon really got mad. And my father didn't say, all right, I'll not preach like that again. He went back to the pulpit the next Sunday and he told the congregation and he said, I'm going to preach the same sermon over again. Yes, I'm glad that my father was a man like that. And that's the sort of blood flows in my veins, too. Sometimes it's nearly bubbling over. Yes. Let me tell you something tonight. There's a great cause, yes. And old young David believed in this cause. And Eliab looked down his nose. People have looked down their nose at the Free Presbyterian Church. Let them continue to look down their nose. We're just a simple-hearted people. We haven't got anything. We never wear anything. We never hope to be anything. We have just got the Lord on our side. That's all we have. We don't have any great committees or any great wealthy people or any wonderful popularity. We have just got the Lord. And we have been most unpopular. And there's no preacher in this city has said more unpopular things than I've said. I've stuck my neck out all the time. And I'll still be sticking it out when there's issues coming. Yes. And they say to me, I had a deputation waited on me once, two men. And they said, dear brother, watch those fellas when they say, dear brother. And they came with scripture in their lips. I said to them, the devil misquoted scripture when he came to tempt Jesus, so I'll watch you fellas. And they said, you know, if you would just simmer down a little and employ different methods, we like what you say, we don't like the way you say it. And I said to those two fellas, I said, there's a door there, and I would just advise you to leave. And if you don't leave, I would be happy to assist you to leave. Yes, sir. I'll just be going on the way that I've been going on for years, preaching the Word of God. I'm not going to compromise for anybody. The gift God gave me is not for sale. No, sir. David said, is there not a cause? And old Eliab looked down at him. And then it came to the years of Saul. Saul is quite a despicable character in this chapter, and Saul sent for David, and the first thing he said to him, he said, 
you're not able to go to heaven. Old Saul wouldn't go himself, but he didn't want anybody else to go. Some people like that, you know. They don't want anybody else to fight. No. Oh, we're not going to fight, but don't let anybody else start a row here. We want to just be in peace and quietness. And then after David brought his argument, you know what Saul said. He said, look at verse 37. Go and the Lord be with thee. Yes. David, go on. The Lord go with you. I'm not going, David, but the Lord go with you. Take the Lord with you. Yeah. And that's what people have said, haven't they? They've sung to the missionaries as they've left, God be with you till we meet again. But they didn't go with them even in their prayers or in their gifts. And then Saul said, well, David, I'm not going, so I don't need my armor. So if you'd like to become a clothes hanger to carry my armor to the field of battle, you can do that. I'll put on my helmet in your hand. So he put his helmet on David. I'm sure it went right over the eyes and over his ears. Big Saul's helmet. And then he put this great coat of mail on. David couldn't even walk with it. And then he put a sword on him. He says, run on, David, now. Have a nice time with Goliath out there. Now, if you turn to verse 5, you will find that the very armor that Goliath had, Saul put in David. What does this mean? This means that Saul's idea was to meet Goliath on his own ground with his own armor. Now, I'm not fighting the ecumenical movement on their ground or with their armor. We can't compete with the money of the World Council of Churches, with its press, with its scholarship, with its attainments, with its genius, with its ability. No, sir, we wouldn't even attempt it. But praise God, we have got something greater than the wisdom of the World Council of Churches. We have got something more powerful than all the equipment of the World Council of Churches. Paul David said, I cannot go with thee. How many evangelical churches, fundamental preaching places in this city are trying to fight for the Lord with the armaments of the enemy? And they think if they have this scheme and that scheme and the other scheme, they're going to win the battle. David put them off. And what did he take? Look at verse 40. I love that verse. He took a staff in his hand. What does the staff speak of? The staff speaks of the presence of God. Thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. What does that mean? It means when the sheep feels the staff on the pressure of the staff on its body, it knows that the shepherd's alongside it. Thank God when I go to battle, I'm going with the presence of Jesus Christ. That's all I've got. haven't got very much, but I've got the Lord's presence. I know the Lord's with me. That night when I was incarcerated for 90 days in the jail of this city, I've told you before I had a wonderful experience. After I'd read the book and said my prayers and got onto that bed, pallet that acts for a bed and pulled an old sackcloth blanket over me and tried to sleep, and then that cell lit up with the presence of Christ. I didn't see anything with these eyes. But with my eye of faith, I saw my risen Lord. Those folks that know me know that I don't weep easily. I could feel most deeply and never shed one tear. But that night I wept. I wept. I sobbed. Not tears of sorrow that I was parted from my loved ones and from my work and from my church. And from the great thing that burdens me, the preaching of the word and the salvation of souls. No, sir, I wept tears of joy that Ian Paisley was counted worthy to suffer shame for Jesus' sake. And I have the presence of the Lord. And if they had come into that cell that night and I've got God's book in my hand and said, Paisley, you're going to be hung now, I could have walked out for Jesus was with me. 
I learned to not sell why the martyrs could die. I learned to not sell why our forefathers could lie in the rack and of every limb of their body torn asunder. They had the presence of Christ. I must have the Savior with me. But I dare not walk alone. I must feel His presence near me and His arms around me thrown. Then my soul shall fear no ill. Let Him lead me where He will. I will go without a murmur. And His footsteps follow still. The presence of Christ. The staff. And then he took five smooth stones out of the brook. The brook speaks to me of the running water. And friend, here is the water of life, the Word of God. And those five smooth stones speak to me of the promises of the Lord. I didn't pick them up and carry them in his hat. No, sir. He put them into his script. You know why, friend? The promise of God in the hand is not enough. It must be in the heart. I've told you before the story of the old lady who lay dying and her pastor went to read to her. He forgot his Bible and he picked up the well-worn Bible of the old lady who lay dying. And he read a portion of Scripture and along the margin of the Bible he read these letters T and T marked against certain verses. And he said to the old woman, what do those mean? She said, sir... Those, is the, those are the verses I have tried and proved. She knew the book, that old woman. She had tried and proved them. Happy is the man who's got God's word in his heart. I will hide God's word in my heart, said David, that I may not sin against thee. And then there's something more. He took a sling in his hand. That's the power of God. And am I going to fight the Lord's battles and slay the ecumenical monster? I've got to have the presence of God and the promise of God and the power of God. And if I've got that, friend, I'm going to be victorious. And David went out to meet the Philistine, and the Philistine laughed at him. <laughs> he says, here he comes, little David. Look at him. And then he said, am I a dog? That was exactly what he was. He just was a dog. You know, the Bible tells us about dogs. It says, beware of dogs. Those are not four-legged ones either. They are two-legged ones. Apostate prophets in the Bible are called dogs. I met Alfie Martin one day, right face to face, and that's what I said to him. I said, you're a dumb dog that cannot bark. That's what you are. That's what the Bible says about these prophets. Yes, of course, we're so nice today, we wouldn't use language like that. That's the language of the book. You say, that's terrible, Mr. Paisley, to say a thing like that. Well, that's what the Holy Ghost said. That language will do me all right. Am I a dog? Well, he was a dog without a tail anyway. That's one thing. And... Uh, David said to him, you can mock me if you like. I'm not coming in the power of the sword or the spear. I'm coming in the name of the Lord. And this assembly will know today that the Lord saveth not with a sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord. I like that verse, the battle is the Lord. And when I'm going out to fight, the Lord's over the battle. Yeah. It's all right. The battle belongs to my God. I can go fearlessly into the conflict, for all will be well. And David hissed and ran toward the army. didn't run away. He ran towards it. Now, old Goliath was a clever man. He had been in the battle before. He saw the sling in David's hand. But David was carrying the sling in his left hand, I believe. And Goliath was waiting for him to change the sling to his right hand to get ready to fire the stone. But David never changed the hand. Because that same Bible tells me that the man that used the sling and the army of Israel were Benjaminites. Benjamin and Judah were closely related tribes. And they slung with the left hand, says the book, to a hair's breadth. Could sling stones. 
So old Goliath's waiting for the changeover, but it was a changeover all right. Soon he was upon his face in the ground. Billy Sunday said he was hit between the lumps, and he went down for the count with a headache that Asperos couldn't cure. That's a good description. Down he went. It says he fell on his face. You would think if he was hit with a stone, he would fall backwards, wouldn't you? But you know, the Bible's right because it was rising ground he was on. Because if he was going to meet it, David, David was coming down a hill. If you read the scriptures, so the Bible's always right. Don't make any mistakes. That's why he fell on his face, for he was going forward. The Holy Ghost wrote this book, you know. It wasn't man that wrote it. If some man had written that and hadn't been there, he would have said he fell backwards, but he didn't. He fell on his face. Now, what did David do then? You know what the fundamentalists would have done then? They would have sung the doxology and gone home. That's what they would have done. But David didn't do that. David didn't put his hands in his pocket and said, Boy, that was a good shot. Best shot I ever made. Well, he didn't do that. You see, there are some fundamentalists, and when they get a little victory, that's all they do. They don't fight it out to the end. But the Bible tells me that David ran, and he jumped in Goliath. That's what he did. He jumped on. Very unorthodox thing to do. The poor fellow with a hole in his head, and then he jumps on. That's not very nice conduct, Mr. Peter. It's not religious etiquette to jump on a man when there's a hole in his head. No, but then the Holy Ghost doesn't go by the policy of man. And then David said, I've no sword, so he pulled out Goliath's sword. And he cut Goliath's head head off. So he had a hole in his head and a hole in his neck there. Yes. Yes. It was a gory sort of thing to do, wasn't it? Yeah. I want to tell you, friend, it's not a picnic that we're on. And this great monstrosity, this world council of churches, we've got to fight it to the death. That's what it means. You go back and count the pieces of armor. The sword's not mentioned. They don't read about a sword until David got it. You know why? Because God wrote in that sword, David. David didn't belong to Goliath at all. He never even got out of the sheath. God gave to David the sword of his enemy. And praise God, God can give us the swords of our enemies. That's the way a man surrendered in the old days. He handed over his sword. And praise God, God had handed over Goliath's sword even before David went to fight. Reminded of the story of the little boy in school. And he was asked by the teacher, how many stones did David take? The little boy said, five, miss. She said, you're right. How many did he use, son? One, miss. Right. She said, how many did he bring back? The little boy said, five, miss. She said, oh, no, he used one of them. He must only have brought four stones back. No, said the little boy. He brought four stones in his bag, and he brought the other stone in the head of the giant. For he brought the giant's head home with him. You know what that is? That's winning the battle and bringing all your ammunition back with you. That's what the Bible says, more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. That's what David was. David was more than a conqueror. Well, my friend, where do you stand in this battle? Are you fighting with David and the Lord? Are you compromising with Saul and afraid? Are you in the armies of the enemy? I was preaching this afternoon in Tandragi, and at the end of the service, a fine man remained behind. He said, I want to have a word with you, Mr. Paisley. And I stepped down to him. I said, what can I do for you, my friend? He says, I'm going to trust the Lord today. So we went into the little vestry and we opened the word and I showed him the scriptures and we knelt down together and he came to Jesus. He was in that service, the enemy of the Lord. Thank God he's a soldier of Christ tonight. He's going to be a good one too. Good soldier of Jesus Christ. Whose side are you on tonight? Are you on the side of the Lord? Are you on the side of David? 
Are you lined up with Saul, afraid to fight? Are you right in the camp of the enemies of the king? I trust if you're not saved that tonight the Lord will save you. If you're a Christian, I trust the Lord will deliver you from apostasy. And if you're a sincere believer, I trust you'll be out and out for Jesus Christ. The day is dark. It's an evil day. It's a terrible day. But thank God it's glorious when you have the presence of God and the promise of God and the power of God. May that be the benediction of every one of us for Jesus' sake. Let's bow our heads.